Good morning. How are you? How are you doing with the lockdown? It's almost been four to five weeks since the governor gave the stay at home order. Are you tired of it? Bored? Frustrated? A bit antsy? Agitated? Restless? Do you feel like you have no control over the situation? Do you feel like you have no purpose as you cannot do the things you used to do? Do you feel all these things? Well, if you're anything like me, uh, you probably are already feeling all these things. You are agitated, frustrated, irritated with what's happening. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you also know verses that are so familiar that keeps coming up uh, in your thoughts and in your mind, at least uh, that I have seen, is that verses like, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's in Philippians. Or in First Thessalonians, it tells us, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, we feel one way, but we know something different as Christians. And, and so there is a conflict within us uh, because of our current situation where we feel one way, but we know something different. And so how do we learn to be truly content in our circumstances? How do we learn to be truly content in our circumstances so that our feeling and our knowing lines up together? And that is really what I want to focus on this morning. And so we are going to look uh, into the book of Job, uh, and especially Job chapter 1. And if you want to turn there to Job chapter 1, we'll take verse by verse. Now, most of us know the story of Job. Uh, you know, what Job experienced is nothing uh, you know, what we are experiencing is nothing compared to what Job had experienced. We're no, nowhere close to what he had experienced. Yet, uh, I believe there are lessons that we can learn from Job that can be applied in our current circumstances. Just a little bit of introduction to the book of Job. You know, the book of Job... Uh, falls in what is called the wisdom literature category of the Bible. There are other wisdom literature books, uh, such as Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and a little bit of the Psalms are considered as the wisdom literature. The book of Job is uh, in some ways uh, structured symmetrically. It, it begins with a prose prologue, and it is followed by a series of poetic debates. And then it finishes off with a prose epilogue. So the chapter that we are going to look at, Job chapter 1, is a prologue. And it introduces us to the person, Job. So if we, let's start with verse 1. It says, In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. So we see that Job lived in a land called Uz, and he feared God and shunned evil. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And, and so we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So some say that Job was a wise man because he feared God and he knew God. So Job was a wise man who knew God. 
he had seven sons and three daughters and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys and had a he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. These few verses gives us, shows us that Job was a man with an impressive uh, wealth and status. He had plenty of cattle, plenty of children. He was what we would consider a blessed man. Verse 4, it says, His son used to take turns holding feast in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Uh, these verses show that Job was really the family priest. He was taking care of the spiritual leader in some sense. And again, this indicates that this was before uh, the, the the Ten Commandments. The law was given as far as the Levites were the only ones who were to offer sacrifice. So it was way before Moses. Uh, Job is considered one of the earliest books in Scripture. But you can see that he feared God and he wanted his kids to fear God. So Job is a very, very righteous, blameless man before God. So in some ways, he was doing everything right. Verses 6 through 12 gives us a glimpse of what is happening in the behind the scenes in the spiritual, in the invisible, in the heavenly realm. We're going to, for right now, going to skip those verses because we are still focusing on the physical realm so we can see some similarity between what's happened, what happened in Job's life to our life. So it, let's skip verses 6 through 12 and we jump uh, to 13. So we see the background that Job is blessed. He has everything. He has a family. He has cattle. Uh, he's doing the right thing. Everything should technically be going well with him. And then in starting in verse 13, it reads, One day when Job's son and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Serbians attacked and carried them off. Carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burnt up the sheep and the servants. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Shanlians formed three raiding parties and swept on on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another uh, messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. In one day, just like that, Job lost everything all his wealth and kids, all of a sudden. Disaster struck Job suddenly. Just, just like that, his circumstances was changed. I mean, th there is some similarity with our circumstances, if I may compare, that our circumstances changed suddenly. There was, things were going normal, life was normal, and suddenly, Things changed for us. It became different almost overnight. Seems like there was no transition period of moving from one state, status, circumstance to another. It just happened suddenly. And, and in Job's case, if if we didn't know about verses uh, six through twelve, we would be speculating a lot of things um, about uh, Job's circumstances. 
you know, after all, we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And so we would speculate and speculations would come in the form of uh, statements like, oh, my goodness, the Satan is in total control. He's destroying everything. Or, or Job must have sinned, uh, so bad things are happening. And that's what we see his friends assuming later in the book. Or, or a standard answer, is, uh, answer would be is, oh, uh, God must be up to something. You know, it, it reminds me of our circumstances. It seems like we as Christians are more interested in speculating what's happening. We are not sure about everything, but we like to speculate rather than focusing on the truth revealed in God's word. We have a temptation to speculate rather than focus on what God has already revealed to us, his truth in God's word. Thankfully, in Job's case, we do not have to guess what's happening. Verses 6 through 12 tells us the reason behind Job's circumstances. Verse 6, going to verse 6, it says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. Now we are focusing on the spiritual, the heavenly, the invisible realm, where there is a discussion, there is a council happening. And, and, and the fact that Satan came with the angels tells us that Satan is an angelic being and is in no way equal to God. We often think of Satan as the opposite equal of God. We think of Satan as the opposite equal of God, but that's not the truth. The truth is Satan is a mere creature and his equal would be a high ranking angel uh, such as Michael as mentioned in the Bible. Isaiah 40, 25 says this, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. There is no one equal, whether in on his same side or opposite side. There is no one like our God. There is no one equal to him. This is one of the reasons why God is worthy of our praise and worship. There is no one, no one equal to him. And that's why he gives us the Ten Commandments and says, there is no God, there should be no God beside me. And in fact, the truth is, there is no other God beside the one God. We see from also this, from this verse that uh, Satan does have access to God's uh, presence. In verse uh, 7, the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. God demands Satan, uh, God demands Satan to state what his business is. And, and Satan says, I am free to uh, access the, I have access, free access to the earth. And I keep roaming around the earth like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright. A man, uh, there is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil. God brings up Job as a subject for discussion. And we see in some ways, God is proud of Job. About Job's godliness and his character that, that God brings him up. 
what a what a compliment uh, for Job's character that God is proud of who he is. Verse 9, it tells us that does uh, Satan responds, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan, who is called the accuser of the brethren, here is accusing Job before God. He is actually saying, uh, and God, actually, Job's uh, godliness is all false. You know, he is only serving you because he wants to get something from you. Uh, Satan's point is that your divine blessings has generated this obedience. So because you blessed him, he is obeying. He also... He also indirectly is accusing God, saying, uh, yeah, Job's devotion is because you are buying it. You're giving him all the good things. So why will he not have devotion? Why wouldn't he worship you? After all, he's getting something good out of it. And so the Satan's logic goes, uh, and he go, continues in verse 10, he says, Have you not put a, a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. There is so much truth in this uh, statement of Satan. The God is protecting his people. That God has a hedge over all of us, that He protects them from all harm, that nothing can touch or harm harm Job. And God has blessed his work. And so Satan tells God, he commands God that but stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan's logic is. Uh, you know, uh, Job's uh, devotion is false uh, because he's trying to get something out of you. Take away what you're giving him, giving to him, the divine blessings, uh, all the things he has. Strike it. Take it away from him and see what happens. I, I can guarantee you that he will deny his faith and face and curse you on his face is uh, the premise that Satan has. Verse 12 tells, The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. God gives Satan permission to attack Job. But it is very limited in that sense is that he, Satan cannot touch Job's life. Satan has always had power to attack humans. But what he lacks is the permission from God. He cannot do everything, Satan. So Satan's activities are temporary and limited in scope. God uses Satan to accomplish his good purpose. And it's so important for us to remember this. That there is no one like our God. That he puts boundaries for every created thing. Whether it is Satan, whether it's angels, whether it's us, or whether it's the ocean, the waves. They all have limitations. We are all limited in that sense. But God is unlimitable. Limited. So that is the background we see in, in the book of Job. So how is all this connected to our circumstances? Well, it, it is important to understand that our focus should be on our God. Our focus should be on God. And, and, and this chapter, this, these few verses, teach us a couple of things about our God. 
and I want to focus on our God because uh, one of the authors write, he says, a right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. Let me repeat that. A right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. In other words, uh, the better we understand our God, the better we can live our lives. The better we understand God, the better we can live our lives. So there is a connection between understanding God and our contentment. There is a connection between understanding our God and our contentment. So what are the things that the book of Job teaches us about our God? What are some of the truths about our God? Well, the first point I want to bring is this. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Sovereign means he is superior. He is supreme in power and authority. He is the ruler. A.W. Tozer, Tozer says, God's sovereignty is the attribute by which he rules his entire creation. And to be sovereign, God must be all-knowing, all-powerful, and absolutely free. God's sovereignty is the attribute by which he rules his entire creation. And to be sovereign, God must be all-knowing, all-powerful, and absolutely free. Absolutely free. Think about it. If we claim that God is sovereign, that he is supreme, then he has to be all-knowing. Because if he misses, if he is not aware, if he doesn't know the minute detail of something in his creation, he is no longer supreme because someone else knows about it. Or all-powerful. He has to be all-powerful. He has to be all-powerful. In the sense, he can do anything. There is nothing he cannot do. And if there is something that he cannot do, he is no longer supreme. He is no longer sovereign. And then he has to be absolutely free. He does not need to ask permission to do something, nor does he need to explain his actions to anyone. If he does, he is no longer supreme. So God is free in that sense. He can do what he wants to do, and he doesn't have to explain it to anyone. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34, 35. This is, this is what Nebuchadnezzar finally realizes after he was driven away from his kingdom for seven years. He then comes to the realization that God is sovereign. And this is what is recorded in the book of Daniel. It says in Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 and 35. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of the heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold him, hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is absolutely sovereign in his rule over his creation. Nebuchadnezzar understood that. And, in, and part of the sovereignty is that God is in control over everything that happens in his kingdom. Over everything that happens in his kingdom. Nothing surprises God. 
We may be surprised by our circumstances, but God is not. So God is in control, we are not. God is sovereign, we are not. So here is a question for us to consider. Is it possible, again, is it possible, that our discontentment may stem from our desire to want to control our lives? Is it possible that our discontentment may stem from our desire to want to control our lives because we think God is not in control? God has given us his creation certain responsibilities that we can have control over. Uh, examples of those controls are our thoughts, our emotions, our attitudes, our actions, the daily chores of life. But there are sometimes it is tempting for us to control every detail of our life instead of letting God con be in control. Sometimes we like to act like want to be God rather than be like God. Is it possible that our content, our desire to control our life because we think God is not in control? And, and, and that's why it's important to understand that God is sovereign. He is ruling over all his creation with all power, with all knowledge, and with absolute freedom. Chuck Swindoll says, a vertical perspective will keep us from horizontal panic. A vertical perspective will keep us from a horizontal uh, panic. The right concept of God, that God is sovereign, can bring us comfort and contentment, knowing that there is someone who cares for us, that there is someone who has control over our circumstances, that we do not need to fear, we do not need to fret, but just trust. <clears throat> In Isaiah chapter 6, this is the uh, scene of when Isaiah was commissioned to become a, be a prophet. It says, In the year that King Uzzah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the earth. Above him were seraphims, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. The verse starts with in that year the king as in the year that king Azza died. Think about it. There was a political turmoil. The king, the physical king dies. And there is confusion and chaos. And then he says, I saw the Lord high and exalted. So even though the physical throne is empty, the eternal throne is always occupied. It'll never end. God continues to reign. And that's what uh, Isaiah saw. He saw beyond this physical world. He focused on the eternal world. And, and, in, and so my point is this, our minds, our knowledge, our concept of God must be transformed in order for us to feel differently. If we are having a conflict within between what we feel and what we know, we need to enlarge our concept of God in order to feel differently. So that is one aspect that we see uh, in, in, in the book of Job. The other truth about our God is that is the second point which I bring up is God always has a purpose in permitting suffering. God always has a purpose in permitting suffering. 
from this first chapter, these few verses, we, we, we see some glimpses of God's purposes in permitting suffering in Job's life. One commentator mentions that uh, we might say that the suffering can also be used of God to reveal his wisdom to the angelic being. I, I personally have never thought about it that way, but yeah, uh, God is using a suffering in Job's life to show his wisdom to the heavenly uh, spiritual realm, to his angelic beings. We also see that God is using suffering to increase uh, Job's faith, his understanding of who God is, his perseverance. God is using suffering to help uh, Job's friends understand what it means to serve God. Job's, uh, God is using Job's suffering to help his wife understand who God is. You know, God's purposes are multitudes and multitudes of purpose that, you know, we will never be able to comprehend. There is no way we can comprehend all the purposes of God. But, but we do know this one thing, that God's purposes are always good. Because he is good, all his purposes are good. <clears throat> so whatever is happening in our life, we may perceive it as not good, but in reality, there is a good purpose behind it. So rather than looking at the present, we may need to learn to look at the future and realize there is something good going to come out of this. Uh, one of the most uh, familiar stories is uh, the story of Joseph uh, in the book of Genesis. Uh, you're familiar with this story. You know, Joseph went through a lot. He suffered a lot. You know, it starts off by him being betrayed by his brothers and, and thrown away and sold uh, to the Egyptians. And then and then even in Egypt, while he was there, he was, uh, you know, uh, falsely accused and thrown into prison. And he stayed in the prison for quite some while. He suffered a lot. And eventually, he, you know, something good comes out of the, all this. He becomes second to Pharaoh and, uh, you know, he reconciles with his brothers. And in the end of the book of Genesis and the end, uh, you know, after uh, his dad, Jacob, dies, uh, it, jo Joseph uh, writes, it says, um, actually the book writes uh, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. He says to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God used Joseph's suffering to bring something good so that he could save the nation of Israel from famine. Oh, wow. God could do amazing things way beyond what we can imagine. Or in Romans 8.28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who has been called according to His purpose. God's purposes are good. Is it possible that our discontentment may stem from our desire to know more than we need to. Is it possible that our discontentment may stem from our desire to know more than we need to? One commentator writes, there is a state of humble contentment of not knowing the answer answers to our current circumstances because we do know our God. There is a humble, uh, there is a state of humble contentment of not knowing the answers to our circumstances. Corey Teen Boom uh, writes, never be afraid to trust an unknown future 
to a known God? Is it possible that our discontentment may stem from our desire to know more than we need to? You know, uh, so th th these are the couple of things that I wanted to share with you is God's sovereignty and God's purposes in permitting evil. God is sovereign and he has a purpose. The question for us is, are we willing to trust God? Like I mentioned, a right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. I believe that our contentment comes by trusting in God's character, in God's promises, and God's purposes. Our contentment comes by trusting in God's character, which is unchanging, and God's purposes, which is always good, and God's promises, which will never fail. Our contentment is connected to the trust in God. Isaiah chapter 26 verses 3 and 5 says, You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, uh, for the Lord the Lord is the rock eternal. Isaiah 26, 3 and 5 says, You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord the Lord is the rock eternal. When we trust in God, we can experience perfect peace. Or like Augustine said, our hearts are restless until it find rest in thee. Our hearts are restless until it finds rest in thee. Our contentment is dependent on our trust in our God. I would like to close by looking at Job the end of Job, Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 3. If you want to go there for a minute, please. Job chapter 42, 1 through 3. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plans of yours can be thought. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I'll speak. I'll question you and I, you shall answer. My ears have heard of you and now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. From these verses, we see that Job's circumstances has not changed yet. He is still suffering. He's still in pain. His, it's a bad condition. Circumstances hasn't changed. But his perspective and God's purposes has changed. Job found contentment in his circumstances. And the reason is that is this that Job finally rests in the realization that while God's ways are sometimes incomprehensible, He can always be trusted. Our God is a trustworthy God that is worthy of our trust. I'd like to finish off by reading Psalms chapter 63, verses 1 and 2. Psalms chapter 63, verses 1 and 2. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Thank you.